Hello everyone, Karen Glasser here and welcome to The Peak Stage. It's a show about wonderful personal stories, inspiration, and the never-ending pursuit of what's next. The Peak Stage is brought to you by Vitalsy, the guide to living in this stage of growth, purpose, and discovery. With guests from all walks of life, join us as we learn and share their inspiring stories of reinvention, resilience, and perspective. Likewise, our stories are still being written with one thing that we know for sure, we are not done yet. Today, we are welcoming Stuart K. Robinson to the stage. He is the CEO partner of Brady, Brannon and Rich Talent, as well as the management firm B Times 2 Entertainment. Stuart is a nationally known motivational speaker and is widely regarded as one of Los Angeles' top acting instructors. In addition to appearing in film, Broadway, off-Broadway, and regional theater productions, he has directed, written, composed many musical theater and solo show productions. So without further ado, Stuart, welcome to the show. How are you? Hi, Karen. I'm well. How are you? I am well. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Um, this has been a long time coming, and we're just going to jump right in. To yeah. reinvention. I want to talk about reinvention with you, specifically in terms of your past and how it brought you into the present. Are there moments in your past that has helped to form you who you are today? That's a great opening question. And, and, and I'm going to start by saying this. We use the word reinvention as though, um, you know, <laughs> in my business, a lot of people assume that there's something wrong with the old model because they they, they are moving into a new model. And, I, and, you know, I work in the entertainment industry and a lot with actors. And I keep saying, you don't have to reinvent what you are. You just have to, you know, grow into who you are and what you do. So the issue for me is I, 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 I'm a we multi-hyphenate, meaning my whole life I've done many things. I've worn many hats. I've had many titles. I've worked pretty much every job you can work in the entertainment industry. And first of all, I, I truly believe that I'm a sum of my parts, that I wouldn't be today who I am if I hadn't traveled down all of those different paths. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of times when I'm advising actors, they feel like, oh, I've gone down this path and I wasted my time. And I always say, how could it be a waste of time when you learned and you gained and you experienced and you saw so many different things. Right, so right. to me, the question of reinvention is really a question of invention because today I am so much more than I was three years ago and I was 10 years ago and I was 20 years ago and I was 30 years ago. I wouldn't have brought to the table right. all of the things that I bring to the table today 20 years ago, because I had no idea. Right, right. And you know, do you ever get asked the question, um, if you could go back, if you could go back to 20 years old, would you? Hmm. Um, well, <laughs> uh, that... That's a tricky question because I wouldn't go back because I don't like where I am now. Mm -hmm. Although I would relish the opportunity to give it another shot. Right. But again, I don't know that I would do it differently because I say if I knew then what I know now, but you couldn't right, possibly right. know then what you know now because of all the experiences you've had, because of the repetition, because of the growth because of the new experiences, et cetera. So, so true. I'm guessing, because I don't think I led a frivolous life. I think I, I think I, I've, in my life, I've done the things that I wanted to do. I also did the things that I felt I had to do in order to survive. Yeah, absolutely. So it probably go the same way. That's such an interesting answer. You know, um, I normally say when I'm asked that, hell no. Yeah. I'm not going back. But then I always have that little asterisk that says, well, if I did go back, I'd want to go back with all the knowledge and everything that I've learned up until now. So yeah. that not necessarily do anything different, but be, maybe just be a little smarter about it. You know, yeah. so it's interesting. And I love the idea that you say it's not reinvention, it's more invention. Yeah. And I'm going to add that, you know, if I did go back, the thing that I would wish for mm -hmm is that I had paid more attention to mentors. In other words, 
if at 20 I could go back and really be more open to people who are the age that I am now, right. Right. their stories, their wisdom, their guidance, right. their experience, right. etc., I have a feeling that journey might go a little better. Yeah, no, I hear you. It, it actually leads me into the next question, and that is yeah. it's talking about your work. You are a motivational speaker. You are a coach. You consult with corporations and organizations and individuals all over the place. So that's part of that teaching thing, right, and sharing what you know. Tell me about that. What do you enjoy the most about mentoring and coaching and life coaching? Yeah, I'm going to answer your question inside out because the interesting part of it is that for me – I didn't figure out what it is that I do until somewhere around the age of 50 or after that. And what I mean by that is not that I didn't have job titles, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it is that I do, what I really do. Not the title, not the job description, not the salary, not what people say about it, but what is the thing that I uniquely bring to every situation. And it took me years and years. I thought I was an actor and then I thought I was a director and then I thought I was an author and then I thought I was a casting director and then I thought I was this. And I thought that I had to aspire to that title. Right. But what I found and, 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 you know, it, 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 it occurred in the phase in which I discovered that I was a teacher. I didn't discover I was a teacher until kind of later on as well. Cause I always thought I'm a performer and I got to do this. Right. Right. And, Teacher had never been on my list until I got in the position to actually work with people and instruct them. And I discovered that I really had a gift for that, that it wasn't just that I had knowledge that I could pass on, but I had an ability to, to really get inside people's heads and really motivate them and really express things in a way that that they could embrace it and, and their eyes would go like this. Is that because so, you're multi-hyphenated? Is that because you have so many things coming to the table at the same time? Yeah, I think that's part of it because I, I was able to go into teaching with no fear because there aren't a whole lot of questions that I didn't have a perspective on. Right. Again, in the entertainment business, uh, what you find is that uh, someone is an actor for a certain period of time and then mm-hmm. they get a second job sort of teaching what they do. Right. That wasn't me. I was an actor and I learned a lot from that, but I was also a director. And my 13 years as a casting director taught me things about the business that I had never known. Uh-huh. So when I learned those things I had never known about the audition room and about the performance part of it, et cetera, I went back to acting. And that's when I started to earn a fortune as an actor because I was approaching it with some knowledge. Right. So all of the things that the paths that I went down as a director and as a composer and as a singer and as an editor and all of those things came together to give me a perspective for my students right. that other teachers didn't have. Oh, I so love that. I so love that. So would you say that that is your legacy? That is what you were put on this earth to do? Well, Or maybe not yet. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, the teaching again is like directing or composing. That's one of the things I use my gift to do. So I want to make sure that your viewers and your listeners don't confuse this that uh I'm not saying you're going to wake up tomorrow and discover you're a teacher because that's a title. Right, right. You're going to discover what you do. It's the way I teach. And when I teach, I utilize the same gift that I utilize when I'm composing, which is the same gift that I utilize when I'm running my companies, which right. is the same gift I'm hopefully I'm utilizing here today, yeah. and the yes. same gift I utilize if I were cooking you dinner. Right. When you find that gift, what it is, and you're able to define it, you're liberated, Karen, because you go into any situation. I know why I'm here. So if they asked me tomorrow to deliver the State of the Union address, the president uh, can't do it and they right. need someone to do it. I would say, sure. I would go into it with no fear Got because it. I know what I do. I wouldn't right. do it the way the president would do it. Right. 
You because do it I, the way Stuart does it. Yeah, I do it my way and I would have no fear. And even right. if I stumbled and I wasn't sure, et cetera, that would be a part of it. Right, right. Because my gift embraces all of that. And so when you talk about reinvention, the best part about being the age I, 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 I've achieved is there are so many more things that I'm able to approach without fear. Yep. Yep. So I'm not, I'm not, if you're afraid you're going to drown, you're going to what drown. people do is avoid the swimming pool. Right. And then you never experience the swimming pool. True. What I do if I have worries that I might drown is become a better lifeguard. There you go. Get in yeah. the pool. And if you get in trouble, get better at saving yourself. Right. Right. So when I'm in concert, I, I'm not worried that I'm going to forget my lyrics because if right. I forget my lyrics, I know how to scat. Right. I uh, I, I totally resonate with that because I've you know done that. I mean, you're a singer. Right. You just you just do what you need to do, and it comes right from you because you know what you do. I just love this. I want to talk about your truth to power inclusion solutions program. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's a mouthful. Um, second of all, what is it? What do you do with that program? Here's what happened. Um, you know, right after the George Floyd uh, murder, um, mm -hmm. a lot of companies, a, a lot of individuals and companies started to call me saying, you know, you've spoken to us before. Some of my own family members called me and said, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't understand what's going on. Can you help me? I've, I, I'm not, I don't walk in your shoes. Can you explain it to me? And, uh, you know, a cousin of mine called me at first and he said, I, I'm embarrassed to call you. Uh, my cousin is not a black man. My cousin is a white Jewish man. And he said, I really need you to explain this to me. W what's going on? Right. He didn't understand my experience or right. the black experience or the female experience or the uh, transgender experience, et cetera. He right. only knows the lane in which he has traveled. Right. And he's the most kind and giving and liberal person in the world. He just can't know what he hasn't experienced. Right. So it was like, what's all this, what's all this shouting about? And so I sat down and explained it to him and he was, reduced to tears because he just said, I didn't know. No. Yeah. You know, a question I ask in my speaking, and I'm going to answer your question in a minute, but I ask audiences of, you know, 500 to 1500 people. I say, I want you all to type into the chat now, um, how many times you have been held at gunpoint in your life, excluding military service? So of the 1500 people, uh, most people say zero. Mm -hmm. Hopefully your answer is zero, Karen. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 2% of the people say one. And usually that's a robbery. Right. And then, you know, and I said to him, my cousin, for me, the answer is five. And all of those times, the guns were police guns. Yeah. Because law enforcement approaches me in a different way than they would approach you if you're behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. They have been told or they have experienced that people who look like me are more dangerous than people who look like you. Right. Now, I understand this, but it doesn't make it any nicer that they come to my car window with guns drawn. Right. It doesn't make it feel any better that they tend to pull me out of the car and put me in handcuffs and sit me on the curb. Yeah. Not because I've done anything, but because their experience tells them that I might do something. You might yes. do something. Wow. Where their experience is that you won't. So we don't need to pull our guns and we're going to say, um, did you know you were exceeding the speed limit, et cetera? Right. But with me, they're going to come with that flashlight in your eyes and the hand on the gun and pull that gun out the minute anything doesn't feel right. So companies started to come to me and say, oh, you know, we're having a, a terrible time because our employees want to talk about this and we don't feel qualified to lead that discussion. Right. right. 
So I made it my business to develop a program in which I could go into companies and organizations or families or with individuals and just have that difficult conversation. Have that difficult conversation in a way that doesn't point fingers, doesn't cast blame, because the discussion is not about law enforcement or racism or discrimination. The discussion is about implicit bias. Mm -hmm. In other words, you and I both have to come to terms with the fact that we're biased. Exactly. We can't help but be biased because we were raised in a, a, a nation that is built on certain biases. We were taught in schools that were built on certain biases. We grew up in communities that were built on certain biases. So we have those biases. And most of the time, we don't know we have it. Right. So the conversation is meant to say, well, I'm going to go off the track here, but you know why um, hypertension is called the silent killer? No, why? Do you know, it's, it's the biggest killer of black men in right. America. I've heard that. It's called the silent killer because you don't know you have it. Like biases. Okay. Yeah. Which is why so many people with hypertension just have a stroke or drop dead or have a heart attack or whatever it is, because they didn't feel any symptoms. They didn't go, oh, this is bad. I need to do something about this. That's just the way they feel. And then keel over. Well, implicit bias is very much the same way. It doesn't feel bad. You fundamentally are saying, I don't hate. Right gay people or women or old people or disabled people or black people or Asian people, you don't have that mentality yet. You still are in the grips of certain huge biases that impact how you behave and how you treat others. So truth to power is simply that, that when you really understand the truth, it empowers you. And inclusion solutions is simply a way of saying, why can't we include one another in our lives, in our work, in our social scene, in our worship, in all of those things? Why do I have to first make a judgment about you because you're a female, because you're of a certain age, because your skin is a certain color, because you have a certain faith? So this program is meant to um, open up the conversation so that we can acknowledge what is and do better. Yes. yes, to raise, to open up the conversation, raise awareness, mm-hmm. to allow us to actually verbalize the things that we're not sure about. Right. And to actually hear some truths about how biases work and yeah. and why we all have them. Because once you, you know, my Angela used to say, When you know better, you do better. You do better. Right. That's that's one of my favorite quotes ever. Yeah. It's one of my favorite quotes. You are also a writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you already mentioned you've done it all. And one of those things that you've done is you wrote a book. It all begins with I. Where did this come from? Why did you decide to write this book? And by the way, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the places that books are sold. Okay, so... Yeah, it's also on Tall Fellow Press. If you go there, that's my publisher, and uh, they can give oh, it to you also, oh. also. Yeah, Tall Fellow Press. So after years of teaching, I found that certain questions would come up. By the way, I started as an acting teacher. Right. But I found that the the sessions always reverted back to life strategy issues. Interesting. Most of my students' issues weren't how well they read the dialogue or played the character. Their issues were in how comfortable they were in their own skin, what kind of belief they had in themselves, right. and right. what kind of game plan they had. I call it goals, strategies, tactics. Mm. In other words, most of us go through life uh, just dealing with what comes to us. Oh, right. I got a call for an audition. Oh, I got an offer to sing uh, the national anthem, etc. And then we do the best we can and we expect that other great things will happen. No, the way really successful people do it is they already have a goal in mind and they have a strategy for how that's going to come about. And then they have right. tactics that they're going to right. enact in order to make the thing happen. 
not wait for the phone to ring, but actually right. create momentum through your to tactics. Get to, that, to get to that goal. Yeah. So my students really latched onto that and started doing really well in life because wow. of it. People would, every day someone would call and say, I just bought my first house because of the thing that you oh, did. Wow. So I decided to sit down and write about the lessons that were most common that came up. And it all begins with I is simple. It's 14 new rules of thinking. Now, here's the idea. We are always looking for someone to blame for why our life isn't going the way it is. But the truth is, I can't make rules for you. Right. Karen. I can't tell you what to do. I can't make you do it. I can't tell my wife what to do. I can't tell my boss what to do, my neighbors what to do, my government what to do. I can't control them. The only thing I can control is me. Right. So pretty much every problem or goal or project that I have in mind begins here. Now I say it, it all begins with I, it's a little clever with the title, it, I, right. but, but to me, I wanted to make a difference between I right. and me, me, um, me, me, me. Even when you say it, it has that feel because that is when we're being, um, well, it's all about me. We we all yeah. it, there's that yeah. expression. It's all about me. It's all about you. It's all right. I love I love the differentiation of yeah. the I versus the me. That makes so much sense yes. to me. So think of I as the spiritual, holier version of you, and right. me as the sort of uh, base human one that wants to satisfy their immediate needs. So I wrote this book of the fourteen rules of thinking that they're rules that I must follow. Right. You don't have to follow them, but if I follow them in my life, this is what will things go better. Right. Because the rules are about how I'm going to react when you're uh, mean to me, how I'm going to set my goals, how I'm going to behave when I'm at my worst, how right. I'm going to shape my beliefs about myself. Right. If I follow those rules, not like good ideas, but like rules. I do it this way. I can almost promise you, your life is going to improve. I love that. But I'm, I'm all about structure and knowing what I'm supposed to be doing next. And I all, I'm a list maker. I literally know what I'm doing from moment to moment. And sure. I always begin, like Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. So similar, it's it, know where you're going so that you can get the steps to get to where you're going. Yeah. You know, I would be remiss, Stuart, <laughs> to mention the next thing. Oh, you're, you're, as we, we mentioned, you have been um, uh, in Broadway, films, all over the place. In addition, you have supplied the voices for over 300 film animated projects. You have appeared in countless television commercials. And yes, most notably, a three-year stint as, wait for it, <laughs> the Fruit of the Loom Purple Grapes. Yeah. I uh, first of all, God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what was it like to be a grape? It was really fantastic. Um, I I didn't know when I was cast. You know, they've had numerous casts over the years because it's a campaign that's gone on for a long time. Right. And I was lucky enough to come in at, at, at one phase of my life, and I had no idea the celebrity that was going to come with it. I've signed more <laughs> autographs as the purple grapes than. Any all of the other things that I've done put together oh my gosh. because the, the public just has an affection for right. the fruits, as we were called. We actually went to um, Wall Street and rang the opening bell of the thing and the place went nuts. Um, oh, no. We uh, everywhere we would go, if we're in costume, um, the response was always through the roof. And not only that, but it was a lot of fun to shoot. And, and I got to work with, uh, you know, two of the the gentlemen that I worked with, one of them had been the original Red Apple. Oh, so wow. He had gone through almost 30 years of doing that role. And so he just had so much experience and so much wisdom and so much generosity about it um, that it was a great experience, which again goes back to 
mentors and hearing the stories of others and their experiences, whether they're positive or negative, really right. learning from that, which is why I don't understand why every young person doesn't hang around a senior citizen as much as they can. Amen. I, we call them peak stagers. We're peak stagers. I don't know yeah. why. I agree with you. They no, should. Peak stage works for me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and that's, again, a part of my thing that you got to learn the language as well. I want to use the terminology that makes people feel empowered and right. best, but I only learn it from sitting with you. Right. So today right. I just gained something. Peak stagers. Okay. Yeah. Great. I want to be in the company of peak stagers because I want to hear their stories. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what their dreams were. I want to hear that time they traveled to Spain and what right. happened because all of that enriches me. So, so, so true. And this is why we do this show, to be honest. it's That's why it's called The Peak Stage. It's why I have interviewed some, not just some, every single guest that's been on the show has had a story to tell, yeah. has had a journey to share from how they got from here to there, and that they keep going. We don't just like get to a certain stage and fall off the cliff, and we just keep on going. So let's talk a little bit about resilience. Um, and challenges that we all have in life. Anyone who tells you they don't have challenges is lying to you. We've all had challenges, right? That, and so can you speak to maybe a challenge or something that you have had to overcome in order to reach where you are? Maybe it's part of the same thing, the, the you know, the driving while black. I mean, you were talking about those are all things that, that, that you as a black man has had to overcome, but is there, are there other things or is that kind of like a huge thing? Well, again, I'm going to not answer your question while answering your question. Okay. I think the better example is, um, I want to tell the story of my son-in-law. Okay. Uh, cause my son-in-law, uh, who is an actor, he had been an actor for quite a while. He had just reached the age of 30 and he came to talk with me. He said, I need your advice. And he took me to lunch and he said, I've decided to quit acting. I, I, I can't do it anymore. I can't take the ups and downs. It's too much. It's too hard on me. I want to be a, a good uh, husband and eventually right. a father, etc. And I just want your blessing, first of all, and your advice. And I said, so I get it. You're tired of beating yourself over the head and it gets exhausting, et cetera. And I support whatever you do. But before you quit, I'd love to see you really try. And his response was, you know, not good because he's like, what do you mean? I've been on Broadway and I've done this and I've done this and I've done that and I've been trying my whole life. And I said, no, 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 I'm not judging you. I'm just saying I want you to really try. Because you're great when an opportunity comes to you. If your agent calls you with an audition, you do the work and you show up and do whatever. But what did you do today? Yeah. Again, yeah. tactics. What did you do today? What did you read today? What did you practice today? Who did you call today? Did you sing today? Did you, did you use your gift of singing at all? Right. Did you share anything? Did you teach anything? Did you read anything and learn something? Because if you're just sitting waiting for opportunities to come, of course you're going to get weary. Right. So to him, it felt like he had no more resilience uh -huh. for this profession. I, I just can't take it anymore. I can't do it anymore. But to his credit, he, he took it in and he, again, got that look of illumination. Right. And he will say it himself. He says it on all the talk shows now. He says, I have not stopped working since that day. And of course, as you know, he, went, he then went on to do. Well, why don't we tell, let me, let, why don't we tell our audience who, who he went he on did. to do yeah. Hamilton and then won a Tony for the, for the role of Aaron Burr. So his name is Leslie Odom Jr. And, um, but none of Hamilton and, the Academy Award nominations and the Grammy wins and all of that, none of that would have happened. Right. Had he not found the resilience 
to step back, and this is what I'm going to call it because I invited him to a class of mine also with rank amateurs, <laughs> first level class. And I said, come to this class. And he was like, oh, God, I did rent on Broadway. And now I got to come to this thing. <laughs> but, but he was willing. And what he saw was what we call beginner's mind. Ah. In other words, he saw people approaching the work, the experience, with nothing but passion. Right. No jaded quality. No, oh, I, ego, I know what I'm doing. No worried about how I'm looking, et cetera. Right. And he was flabbergasted because he would do the exercise that they would do. And he'd go, well, I, you know, I nailed that. And then he'd watch himself back and go, that wasn't <laughs> what I intended. And then wow. he'd watch these absolute beginners and see the spark of passion in them. Right. So resilience, especially for those of us in our peak stage, it's not so much reinvention and figuring out a, way, a better way to do it. It's being able to approach moments of your life mm -hmm. with a beginner's mind, meaning I'm going to take this as if I know nothing. I love that. I want to take this conversation with you. Not like I'm an expert on, but like, Let's see what, what I can learn right. and what I can contribute as a beginner, as though this is the first time we've ever done this. Right. So resilience to me is about being able to hold on to your beginner's mind mm. and be willing to grow and to learn in the experience. And you'll find that it gives you a resilience. Love it that you never knew you had. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, um, here at the peak stage, us peak stagers, rather than focusing on the topics that keep us up at night, that itty bitty committee in our head that gets us going all night long, we would rather focus on those things that make us want to jump out of bed in the morning that we're passionate about. So mm -hmm. I have to ask the question, what are you passionate about right now? What are you jumping out of bed that you cannot wait to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I got to tell you, I love speaking. I love being here with you. I love being in front of a crowd of 1,500 people. I love being on, you know, network television, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it, on days where I have a speaking engagement, there's nothing better. Wow. And, and I was saying this to my wife the other day. There's a better version of me that shows up when I'm really? in that mode. Interesting. There are, there's, there's other versions of me that I'm not as thrilled with. <laughs> and I find that that best version, like it, let's say I'm traveling to Denver to do a speaking engagement. I'm a better version of me when I wake up in the morning. I'm a better version as I'm getting packed, getting dressed. I'm a better version at the airport. I'm a better version of me on the airplane. I'm just already in that space. In yeah. that space. And right. I'm dealing with people in a way that is more generous and right. more patient. And when I arrive at the event, you know, the driver of my car, we get into a great thing. And he's like, wow, I'm so glad I met you. Not because I'm so great, but because you engaged. I'm in a more generous, engaged mode. Right, right, right. So the speaking event itself, which is usually an hour, hour and a half, is only the icing on the cake. I've already right. been a better version of me. So I'm always excited to wake up in the morning and do something like this. You have another book in you? I do. I've actually been working on that. Um, you know, it all begins with I was my third book, um, but it was the first one that was a self-help book. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I have more to say about that. I think I think you're right. <laughs> I think you absolutely are right. You know, you're you're entertaining. Obviously, you're you're an entertainer, but you are also very um, 
easy to listen to, very understandable. You have the, I've literally had several aha moments as I've been listening to you. I'm going to have to go back and I'm going to pull some stuff out because there were some really good things in here. Um, I, I really appreciate you. And I know that our viewers are going to want to be able to follow you and figure out, you know, how to get more of, of Stuart. They can visit you on your website at stuartkrobinson.com. And you are all over social media. Just, just look for at uh, Stuart K Creative and you'll find Stuart everywhere. Um, any last minute thoughts that you didn't get to say? Yeah, uh, I think I'll close by quoting a chapter from my book, which is simply this. That you said it early on, life is filled with challenges. It can be a bumpy road. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need to invent yourself every time you hit a bump in the road. If you were a surfer, professional surfer, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want the ocean to be calm. Right. You'd want waves to challenge you right. that are going to get you in motion, etc. Sometimes as we age, we have less patience for that. And we keep looking for some magic wand solution mm -hmm. to make our lives happier, to make it better. But I'm going to say that you can impact the happiness level of your life by at least choosing this to always do what I call the highest thing. Not the smartest thing. The not the safest thing. <laughs> not even the best thing. Who knows what that is? The highest thing. The thing that is best for everyone involved. If I can make a decision that I know is going to be good for you, and is going to be good for myself. Yep. That's the highest thing. The thing that's going to stand up over time. Right. Right. I call them win-wins. I won't do anything unless the person I'm doing it with, there's something in it for them that we both feel that we have gained and given at the same time. So I am 100% be, uh, you know, behind that. I think that's such an important statement. Stuart, you're amazing. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. And and for all of you who are watching, make sure you check out Vital C, vitalc.com. We have all sorts of shows there. We have sports shows and health shows. We have Peak Stage. Uh, we have Hot Flashes. We have uh, Overtime, amazing shows. Of course, I happen to think that our show is the best, but, you know, that's just me. Yeah, um, well. So go out. Give somebody an awesome day because we are thrilled you chose to spend it with us today. You have a choice as to where you spend your time. You made the decision to spend it with Stuart and I today, and we are very happy about that. We'll see you next time on the next episode of The Peak Stage. Goodbye, everyone.